All right, welcome everyone. Uh, we'll get started here in a few minutes, but I'd like to wait for uh, some of our expected participants to flow onto the platform. While we wait uh, on screen, you will see the AERIS content disclaimer. Uh, AERIS webinars, content, and media are created and published online for informational purposes only. Uh, it is not intended to be a substitute for professional advice. If you'd like a full copy of it, it can be found on our website. Um, also, the webinar will be recorded and available in the next few days. While we continue to wait for some attendees to join the platform, I would like to respond to a few inquiries that we received during the registration process. Uh, yes, the ARIS Climate Risk Assessment Report powered by Climate Check is currently available. More information on it can be found directly from our website, and you can just uh, click through the links there to find out more information or just contact your ARIS representative. One other housekeeping note today, uh, we will have a dedicated time for Q&A with the panelists after the formal discussion, uh, but please enter any questions you have into the Q&A section of the platform as opposed to the chat section. It's just easier for us and we'll make sure that nothing gets lost if it gets posted in the chat. Um, with that, I'd like to get started. So uh, I'm Dave Colonna, the Director of Lender Services here at Harris, and today we're pleased to host Integrating Climate Risk Assessment and Environmental Due Diligence. Um, you know, as many of you guys know, climate risk considerations are front and center right now in commercial real estate transactions. Millions of U.S. properties are at risk, and many more will face increased vulnerability from climate-related hazards and extreme weather events. Um, property owners, investors, environmental professionals, developers, lenders, and insurers must increasingly evaluate, disclose, and make decisions based on physical climate risks for individual properties and more extensive portfolios. They also must align these assessments with existing due diligence processes. Uh, to be clear, today's discussion will focus on physical risk from climate rather than broader topic of climate risk and ESG in general. Uh, just a quick agenda for today's call. We're gonna cover physical climate risk and data. We'll cover factors driving increased attention to climate risk and assessments some of the data and outputs included in climate risk evaluation and the typical scope of work for climate risk due diligence. Uh, who's using climate risk data currently? How are they using it? And how environmental professionals like yourselves can assist throughout the assessment process? Uh, we'll also cover an overview of ASTM's new standard for climate risk and property resilience and its application for environmental due diligence. Uh, we're very pleased to have uh, two really esteemed guests and panelists this afternoon. Cal Inman is the founder and CEO of Climate Check, a climate risk data company. He's also a Bay Area real estate developer and a lecturer at UC Berkeley. We also have Holly Niebuhr, CEO of AEI Consultants, an employee-owned property consulting firm with over 25 uh, offices across the U.S. Holly's currently chairing the development of the ASTM standard for the assessment of physical climate risk and other natural hazards for commercial properties and is active in several committees, boards, and associations, including CRU, the National Engineering and Environmental Due Diligence Association, CREFC, and more. Uh, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Cal and get started. Thanks, Dave. Um, I'll share my screen here. Now, I'm excited about the conversation today because I think uh, look, it's the Wild West right now, and folks are trying to figure out what to do here with climate risk, um, who's using it, uh, and really, how does it fit into real estate due diligence? Um, like Dave said, my background's in commercial real estate, so I kind of sat on the other side of due diligence for most of my career, getting phase ones, PCAs. Uh, we started Climate Check about four years ago to help folks understand what their risk is to these climate related hazards. Uh, so I just wanna briefly talk about what climate risk is, uh, an example of kind of an end product uh, and just get into the data a little bit. I don't wanna bore everyone with the data so we can jump into how are due diligence folks helping the end user understand this information and really give them actionable insights about how to protect their assets. 
All right, so real high level of physical climate risk. We're looking at all natural hazards affected by climate change. What's the risk profile of that hazard today? And then most importantly, how is that risk profile changing into the future? And that's informed by these global climate models. Uh, the hazards, fundamental hazards we cover alongside others are heavy precipitation, drought, extreme heat. Those three are kind of considered ongoing chronic hazards that affect operating expense, quality of life. Uh, and then there's the acute hazards, the hazards that cause total loss. And we, we, we think about wildfire, uh, extreme winds, and then flooding. And flooding is pretty complex. Uh, there's lots of types of flooding, but all of these categories cause damage to a property. Um, investors, lenders, stakeholders in real estate want to understand, quantify uh, what those risks are moving into the future. So for all of these, we look at, again, risk today and then risk up to 40 years out into the future. Uh, I'm just going to give you an example of flood so you can understand what the base data is within the product. Um, again, flood's the most complex hazard. Uh, it, it consists of, our flood models consist of four different types of flooding. Uh, pluvial really just means surface flooding, like the map on the right here in Houston. Uh, hurricane uh, came through, lots of rainfall comes down, and there's unporous, uh, in, in porous uh, coverage, lots of concrete, uh, the area floods and there's damage occurs. Uh, fluvial flooding is kind of what we associate with the FEMA flood map, uh, river flooding. A river gets backed up and that's, you know, in some areas well tracked uh, and others not so. So we include that data as well. Um, sea level rise, uh, considering high tide and king tide flooding and then storm surge. Uh, so we have all these different types of flooding. It's on pretty granular data. It's on a 10 meter grid. And what that means is within a, a commercial asset, you can really understand where there's flood, what the level of inundation is on a specific property. Um, and so alongside kind of, we have a, a rating system that is one through 100, one being the lowest, 100 being the highest uh, risk. Alongside that, we provide key metrics for each hazard we look at. So what's the probability of a flood? 30%. What's the depth? Six feet or is it six inches? So we give all of that information for an individual asset. And I don't want to go deeply into emission scenarios, but we do look at multiple emission scenarios, which is considered scenario modeling to understand what the range of uncertainty into the future is. Because again, these are predictive models that look out into the future. Um, so we have all this data, right? Uh, all these different data sets on all these different grids. How, it's, it's very similar to kind of the ESA world for the due diligence folks that um, are doing phase ones. We look at uh, the parcel boundaries and understand what risks does that individual property have? And then we look around the property to understand kind of community level risk. Um, so this is an example of a parcel that a developer is looking at in Texas. And uh, these are our flood maps that we've developed in-house on the right. Uh, so I'd like to walk just briefly through an example report, and then we can kind of uh, let Holly uh, explain kind of how, how they're helping folks understand this information and create uh, resiliency, resiliency strategies around it. Uh, the report is a 30-page PDF. Uh, we look at individual properties. This is a report that was pulled just uh, last Tuesday from a REIT that was in contract uh, for a new asset they're bringing in. Um, and so they pulled this report. Uh, we rank all the hazards from highest risk to lowest risk. So precipitation being the highest here. Flooding, there's some flood risk and I'll, I have some excerpts from that, those pages. Uh, there's some heat risk and this asset doesn't have any wildfire risk or drought risk. Um, Here's an act, and then again, looking at the parcel boundaries, this looks like it's a, a mall with a pretty big surface parking uh, right next to a freeway. Uh, so double check, make sure we're looking at the correct asset. And then here's an excerpt from our flood maps that we've modeled in-house. You can see some inundation or flooding on the east side of the property. Uh, and Holly, I'll get into this a little bit more, but 
were in these reports, we are presenting risk. Uh, and then the next step really is looking at what's the vulnerability of the property. So just some things that jump out at me here is there's some flooding of the road, local roadways that could affect vehicular uh, access. Um, is the flood inundating the building or is it just the parking lot? So these are all things to look at to understand what's the property's vulnerability to this natural hazard in the future. Um, and then just briefly, I pulled an excerpt from the heat risk pages. We're looking at these multiple scenarios moving into the future. We look at number, what is a hot day in this specific location? And then how many of those hot days are you gonna have in the future? And that's what this graph right here represents. Uh, and what's important is these reports break it out over the time horizon, over the next 40 years. So we can understand incrementally how it's getting, where it's going. In this case, it's getting hotter and it is getting hotter more often. There's more hot days per year. Um, and then just one final thing, we always try to show population weighted uh, risk. So how do you compare to the rest of your state? How do you compare to the rest of your community? Uh, and this becomes important for factors like flood and fire, because if your asset is on a hill and the entire community around you floods, it's important information to know when we're thinking about vulnerability, uh, you know, the business that's operating there. So that's really high level of the report. Um, you know, Eris has a lot more uh, samples and can kind of dig in deeper to each of the hazards. But I want to show the end product for a specific asset. Uh, and this is primarily used for due diligence in origination uh, or acquisitions. Um, but then the second primary use case that we, we do a lot with customers is kind of looking at an existing portfolio of assets. So we take those same individual data sets and property reports and kind of roll it up into one portfolio and understand where's the distribution of risk for each hazard. Uh, so this is a private equity lender uh, with a few thousand assets. And you can see kind of on the, on the second tier flooding, this histogram is really small. You probably have to zoom in, but they have some flood risk, um, some group of properties that has flood risk. And you can kind of see the geographic distribution. It seems pretty evenly distributed across the country. And then you might also look at fire. They have less properties with fire risk, but you can see it's pretty concentrated on the West Coast. So this starts to help uh, understand how are we looking at our ex existing portfolio, thinking about risk management, how do we protect and mitigate these risks, and really ultimately inform investment thesis. So this just gives you some idea of how these reports are used. Uh, again, this is just a visual and it's kind of backed up by data, but I think um, a lot of folks probably here to understand how our clients using this data um, and how are due diligence professionals helping them? So uh, I think this is a good segue uh, for Holly to talk a little bit about kind of the governance frameworks being developed and uh, what she's doing. Thanks, Cal. Yeah, so I see some questions in the chat there and maybe some of my comments will touch on that. So with uh, the ASTM standard for property resilience assessments, we've been working for the last couple of years to develop the PRA process and standard, and we're moving towards balloting uh, next month. And um, it's been a great experience, lots of different perspectives involved. We've got a lot of lenders involved, um, equity owners, consultants, engineers, architects, design professionals, and climate modeling uh, companies and scientists as well as associations involved with the built environment and um, natural hazard preparedness. And we've expressed in our PRA process that it's a three-stage process. The first step is taking information like what you just saw from Cal. Um, and I did see a question in the Q&A about earthquakes and seismic. Um, with our property resilience assessment guide, ASTM guide, we have made a decision to be multi-hazard and to include hazards beyond those related to climate change um, because the principles of resilience apply no matter what the cause of the hazard might be. So uh, the climate check information, you would supplement that with some other information, maybe on seismic risk. 
would be in stage one. Stage two is actually understanding what's the exposure of the property to those hazards. Um, you know, a, a assisted living facility is going to experience a hazard differently than a self-storage facility. And so we need to not just utilize uh, a desktop model, but also some critical thinking skills on the part of uh, due diligence professionals to think about what is the property use as well as the property attributes. So type of construction, age of construction, elevation of the building, um, whether there are existing resilience measures, um, you know, in the case of high wind, there are uh, roof systems that are much, perform much better in high winds. So if those measures are already in place, then something that shows up as high risk on Cal's report could be somewhat mitigated by understanding what's the actual situation there at the building on the ground. And then in stage three, we're identifying the resilience measures that could improve the performance of the property given the hazards of concern. So I think I'll leave it there and we'll, we'll cover more later as we go through the questions with Dave. Yeah, that's that's really great. Thanks, Colin, and thanks, Holly. Um, you know, Cal, you mentioned uh, REITs being one of your your larger clients right now, and how you touched on some of the you know potential stakeholders and end users. But I, I am curious to maybe just talk talk through that a, a little bit more. Um, and Cal, you can or how you can speak from from experience being a you know being an end user of the, the climate check product. But Cal, if you want to maybe just uh, maybe expound on that a little bit and talk through who exactly is using it, whether you're seeing more portfolio type work or if it's more, you know, transaction by transaction. I think that would be really helpful right now. Yeah, I think every group's different, right? Like I said in the beginning, it is the Wild West right now. Um, I think historically how we've seen the adoption of this data uh, has been through kind of ESG reporting. Uh, and, and, and this is our experience anecdotal, but the REITs really took hold to it. Um, I'd say the majority of REITs are doing some type of climate risk reporting as part of their ESG reporting. And then you see it trickle through the organizations and it gets pushed into the acquisition folks and it becomes part of the due diligence process. So we usually start, and typically it's different everywhere. Sometimes it starts within acquisition and due diligence and then moves into ESG reporting. But um, so we'll, for ESG reporting, we'll look at kind of the overall portfolio. And this really gets into risk management too. Um, and then any new assets brought in, uh, they'll do kind of deeper due diligence on those individual assets. Uh, that being said, so the REITs are doing it, private equity, there's a lot of growth in that space for us. Uh, and then a lot of lender conversations. Um, I think they're all watching uh, these SEC uh, proposed climate risk disclosure. Uh, and trying to understand where do they ingest the data in their organization and how do they think about it when they're looking at origination. Uh, so I think that's something to watch uh, closely. Uh, and that's my experience. I don't know, Holly, uh, what are you seeing? Yeah, I mean, it, I think it parallels what you're seeing, Cal. We've um, definitely seen the REITs adopt it more quickly. Um, they also, you know, we're talking about kind of what's driving this uh, attention on this. I think one of the most important drivers right now is the property insurance market. So anyone owning real estate assets, commercial real estate assets right now is aware that um, we've had multiple years in a row now of double digit pricing increases on property insurance as a result of um, the natural disasters that have occurred. And so um, there's increasing attention to what can we do to help our buildings perform better? What, what can we do in an asset preservation mindset, um, as well as the ESG mindset that you mentioned, Cal? Um, so I think, yes, first adopters would be owners and, and REITs that are finding, okay, property insurance is increasing. How do I help my buildings um, retain their value? The next uh, group of folks that um, we've heard from are the lenders, like you mentioned, Cal. In fact, um, really what brought me to this space was uh, two of our clients who I think kind of began early on looking at how do we incorporate this type of climate risk information in our environmental site assessment process, which is interesting because I think we have in this space, there are so many different silos. There's a sustainability, there's sustainable finance, there's ESG. Uh, as a lending institution, you're making certain commitments. 
Um, then we have regulatory factors that are maybe pushing you to think about risk in a broader fashion. And then you have folks trying to solve for that. And I think it's um, really important for those of us in the due diligence community to realize that we have been helping lenders manage risk for decades and that expanding the view of what risk is to include climate change and natural hazards is a natural fit. And we have a lot to offer in terms of how to enhance the due diligence process. So it's effective and it flows through those same channels that know how to manage these issues. So absolutely, we've seen, I see a question in the Q&A about our consultants, including Climate Check within their ESAs. And yes, we have a few clients that have us do that now. I think they are, I think I would say experimenting with how to use this information. I don't know that anyone is, um, you know, utilizing it for credit decisions at this point, but they want to experiment with, okay, what does this do to the due diligence flow when we gather this information? What do we do next? So yes, I've seen I've seen those conversations happen as well and increasingly happen. Yeah, and I'll just add to that too. I mean, it's the industry is evolving very quickly. Um, and we feed data directly to a, a lot of different groups. Uh, but what's happened as it's evolved, they start looking at the information like, hey, we need help from a human that understands this and really we want to understand where our vulnerabilities are and what we can do about it. And I think that's kind of, I, as I see the industry shaking out, you know, the due diligence consultants are really kind of stepping up and helping do that and where we can provide the base information. Uh, so the, it's, I think that's kind of the next step of the evolution. Yeah, one thing I'll add to Cal is, um, you know, the conversations that I've had with a, a number of lenders, it, more so I'd say over the past six months than, than obviously, you know, probably in the past two years, three years combined, um, they're sort of starting to struggle with how to benchmark their portfolio. And, you know, you have all these assets on the books and sort of uh, understanding where they are today, not just, you know, what the process is going to look like moving forward at origination for new assets that they bring on. But, um, you know, that's why that portfolio report really, really kind of resonated. I think it's it's something that could be useful and certainly a good first step. But I, I do want to talk a, a little bit about, you know, ongoing sort of due diligence, incorporating your data into the ESA process, because I, I think that, you know, the, the folks on this call in particular are in a really unique situation in that we're at the forefront of, of something where you can really be thought leaders and really add value to whether it's your clients or whether you're a risk manager at, you know, within a lending institution, uh, the natural place for this stuff to fall is going to be within those departments and, you know, within folks on this call. So, you know, any advice or, or guidance you can give there, I, I think would be really relevant right now. Well, I, you want to speak yeah, to that? I'll jump in on that. Yeah, I think um, just speaking for AEI, we're really working on creating greater awareness across our entire team of this information. I think it's a learning experience for those in the environmental assessment community. That's my background personally. Um, and you know, we have experience in ESAs pulling in blood maps and radon zones and things like that. And so on some level, it's not that different. It's just adding a new set of hazards that we're commenting on in the ESA. I will say um, from the property resilience assessment, the ASTM standard that I mentioned earlier, from that perspective and as a consultant, um, the performance of the actual assessment of how vulnerable is the property, what is the potential damage to the building, recovery, functional recovery time, um, safety considerations, and community resilience considerations. That's all within stage two. And it really does require a building professional, engineer, or architect. Um, so I think the more those many consulting firms do both ESAs and PCAs, I think that the PRA process is more likely going to be kind of aligned with the PCA side of the business, where the ESA staff can certainly offer assistance in that initial screening phase. Yeah, I think. I mean, this uh, PRA uh, guide 
is so thorough and so thought out and there's so many people involved uh and it's just a great resource uh and uh you know, we could spend 20 hours kind of going through all of that um yeah i did i i think you did a really good job with that and everyone involved did a good job with it yeah that's great so so we know obviously astm uh i don't know how is there a timeline as far as uh, I don't want not to put you on the hot seat here, but um, it maybe maybe just next, speak to next steps and and sort of what the progression looks like and um, you know any insight as to what the SEC is doing. That's that's obviously coming down the pipe. I've I've heard probably a dozen different <laughs> timelines for that over the, the past couple of weeks too. So um, I, I think timing is, is important to understand as well. Yes. Um, okay. So first on the ASTM side, um, for those that might be interested, we're this task group is in EO625, which is performance of buildings, full buildings and facilities. We're WK62996. If you'd like to, if you're already an ASTM member and would like to get involved, we will be going to ballot in the next month or two. And the balloting process, if you're involved with ASTM, you know this is it's an open consensus-based process. So we will receive all the feedback and comments, and then each one of those comments will need to be addressed. So until we ballot, it's not clear how much discussion we have and how much additional work we have. We also, um, while we're going through the balloting process, we've reached out to several organizations for peer review, including the National Institute for Building Sciences, NIST, ASCE, and some other organizations. So as we receive their feedback, we're also um, making modifications. So I am hopeful that whether it's one round of balloting or two or whatever it takes, uh, we will be publishing a standard this year. And the beauty of ASTM, it's a lot of work, but it's also the beauty of it is that it's a consensus-based standard. So it represents all these different viewpoints. And as far as SEC, um, ASTM did submit a letter to SEC during their open public comment period to let them know about the PRA standard. I believe the SEC guidance is supposed to come out March or April of this year, and we will see if it includes any reference. Uh, the, the draft really just had pretty general references to physical risk. And most of the debate regarding the SEC guidance seems to center on carbon emission reporting. So, and, and there are ASTM standards working on that side of it as well. So we will see what comes out of that. Yeah, I, I think that's an important distinction and something that does get lost, you know, the difference between physical climate risk and just the, the broader ESG topics. I think it's a, it's one of the functions of just ESG in general. I think everybody tries to kind of lump everything in together. And um, I, I think it's really great that you guys do have a, a really focused standard on the physical climate risk, because that's, I, I think that's what's important. And that's, you know, that's what we're focused on, obviously, here today as well. Well, um, I think the physical risk side, I mean, like, so what, regardless of what SEC or the Federal Reserve or OCC or any of those groups do, there's still this asset preservation consideration of, <laughs> Property insurance prices are rising. Borrowers are not able to maintain the insurance levels that are required under their loan covenants with the banks. And everyone's looking for how can I help improve the performance of the building. Uh, the Climate Check site has a really great set of resources. In fact, I saw one of the Q&A about, you know, what type of information is available for, let's say, your affordable housing developer. If you go into the climate check site, you can see if I have these hazards, these are the resilience measures that would help the property retain its value and perform better. So um, there is a lot of information out there that's helpful to people. And I'll also just throw out on the housing topic that HUD was one of the first organizations to kind of take a stand and say, like put their <laughs> effort out there to say, we want this to be considered. So HUD last summer, issued guidance that for new construction or substantial renovation projects, they wanted this type of information to be looked at. And they gave the example that if you're building housing in Pacific Northwest, historically, you may not have included air conditioning in that plan. Going forward, of course, if you have access to knowledge about high heat, then you would say, okay, we need HVAC for this facility. Um, so it's just, it's kind of common sense, really. 
Yeah, I think uh, those are great points. And I think even just the re regulation frameworks aside, you know, just look at the REITs. It's becoming kind of best practices. Once a few folks are doing it, you don't want to be holding this property at disposition at the end of a fund, private equity fund and everyone's doing it. So I think we're seeing this kind of race for everyone to kind of make sure they're looking at this when they're acquiring a new property. And then Dave, to your earlier question, I think what what can they what can folks due diligence folks do with clients? I think a lot of a lot of people are surprised once we meet with them, start feeding them reports information, how many of their clients are doing some level of climate risk due diligence internally, directly. Uh, and that'd be like them going and pulling the you know ESA data uh, directly, right? And trying to interpret that themselves. And me as a kind of investor, like the, I'm not qualified to do that. Uh, so I think there's a great opportunity for kind of the whole community right now to to help all their clients uh, with this with this uh, this scope of work. That's great. Um we have a, a bunch of questions and I want to, I want to give them time. So I'm going to, I'm going to start going through these and I think it'll probably definitely elicit a little bit more uh, conversation as well. Uh, the, the first one I wanted to, to ask, uh, Cal, I believe this probably goes to you. Is the risk rating incremental or, or geometric? Um, goes on to say uh, 100 is 10% or worse than 90 or 10 times worse than than 90 percent. does that make sense yeah i'd say just high level on risk ratings there is no uh, consistency and framework for risk ratings between vendors like ourselves and other folks and so it's not apples to apples so i just uh caution everyone to understand what's in each one and how do you create thresholds uh to you know throw up red flags uh when you're doing some type of screening uh, our risk rating is a relative rating. Uh, it's relative to risk today and then risk into the future, but it's also relative to the contiguous US. Uh, so you can compare two properties. And then we have thresholds that we use for different groups. Again, like Holly said, depending on the asset class, some folks are most concerned about flooding and wildfire, but there are a lot of people who are interested in extreme heat, uh, and it, right? So if you think about memory care or uh, senior living, so it really depends on the asset class, but we try to help uh, groups kind of create thresholds around those ratings. But I think even beyond that, the key is the metrics that we or other vendors provide alongside the ratings. Like the real meat of it is what's the probability of a flood? What's the depth of the flood? And where's the flood happening? And so we're finding a lot of people are just using that data to screen properties uh, alongside the ratings. Okay. Um, and seismic has come up here. It looks like a, a couple of times too. Any plans to to add seismic to the report? Yeah, we have two people working on getting some uh, the seismic data in to kind of make sure we, we meet all of these uh, different items in the the stage one of the ASTM guidelines. So seismic, uh, landslide, all these other observed uh, and um, model data sets. Uh, that aren't necessarily tied to climate change, they're important for us to kind of communicate because look, the end user's looking for it uh, and it's easiest just to get it all in one place. So these are all things we're, we're working on in advance of uh, this, uh, Holly finishing this guide. Okay. Um, anything else coming that users should potentially be aware of? Uh, from our end, I mean, we have a Canadian rollout next month. Uh, we're super excited about that. And then we're just constantly working on bringing in the best science and just, just focus on the data and the communication of it, uh, improving all the hazard models. Okay. Um, Dave, Dave, if I could just jump in on the PRA. So I think one of the concerns about utilizing this type of information, especially in a credit underwriting scenario is what's the validity of the data and, and, and if there are so many different providers of this information and they're all using different risk metrics and so on. Um, one part of the ASTM standard is a common set of transparency guidelines. So we're not trying to require that all the models use the same language for everything, but we are asking that they all be transparent about what goes into their models. I saw another question about what climate models are used. So it's it's 
at this point, what we're trying to do is just um, encourage transparency and Climate Check has been really good about that. I think uh, Cal wouldn't mind me saying this, but there's this quote that all models are wrong, some are useful, you know? And so I think it's important that people realize that when, when you receive the output uh, of this climate information, this risk information, that it not be, that's the end of the story, but that you think about the scenarios like we talked about before and Cal mentioned what's physically there at the property and what's the nature of use, um, especially when we think about credit decisions being made. And I see a question here about environmental justice. That's a real concern in this world here is because oftentimes the climate risk, uh, the climate risks are, you know, matching with the environmental justice um, areas that have already been impacted by contamination and other things. So if these communities become, uh, have less access to capital because lenders started are starting to look at climate hazard risk, then I think uh, there's a real potential for things to be uh, unintended, unintended consequences. So um, I see the question on environmental justice. Our standard does not address it directly. I think there is another ASTM standard looking at that, though, and it's a really important point. Yeah, yeah. it's a re really important issue that needs to be looked at. And that kind of our view is like there's a big asymmetry of data when you have, you know, lots of large companies using this information to inform their decisions. Uh, and our, our view is like, let's let's bridge that asymmetry of information and give everyone the information. And then we can make better policy decisions together, but it, need, it needs to be thoughtful and there are, there are always unintended consequences. Uh, but and, and on the transparency topic, I think it's so important to understand what models are being used, where the data is coming from, and as important is what's the uncertainty? Like how's the data being communicated? Uh, Cause this is projected climate models in the future. So there's a huge amount of uncertainty in there. And so I think, whatever reports or information you're getting needs to 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 present that accurately and transparently yeah i think one of the challenges that banks are facing is developing policy and and at the end of the day making underwriting decisions based on this these new data sets that like like we all know they they probably don't understand it as well as a, a lot of folks would like but um it's it's here and it's it's certainly something that you know, is going to have to be accounted for as we move forward. Um, Holly, the next question is actually for you. Um, is AI currently hiring ESAs who possess background and focus in climate change and sustainability who can perform these types of assessments? Yeah, so we do have some folks on staff who have a background in sustainability and understanding GIS and modeling. Um, but like I was saying earlier, uh, I think in the field, and I see some questions about site inspections and so on, I imagine that um, in the, the ones that we have done so far, the site inspection work, the understanding of damage, recovery time, safety considerations, that's being performed by engineers and architects on our PCA side and seismic side. So it's, it's a really a team effort of the sustainability folks and the um, building professionals. Yeah, I think that's an it's an interesting question, Cal. I'd like to maybe turn it back to you for a second. As far as maybe job titles of clients that you know the folks that you guys are working with, who who is it that's ordering it within some of these organizations right now? Yeah, I think like if you're kind of doing discovery work amongst your client, I think the main folks to go to if it's a bigger shop, uh, risk, uh, any anyone that manages risk. Uh, sustainability officers, I mean, all of the big private equity shops, REITs have sustainability officers. A lot of time it starts with them. But then I think like the acquisition folks own the, the actual ordering of the reports. So we'll see it kind of start within risk and then the actual ordering will come from the folks doing, the, you know, getting these projects started and doing their due diligence on it. Okay. That's good. Um, so next question, uh, and uh, either of you is, is free to answer this one. And are consultants starting to include climate check with their environmental site assessments? Uh, who's typically requesting it? We kind of just covered that. Um, 
and, and this is a, a good piece here. Are there any protections or requirements which would incentivize uh, those in CRE to need this report? So that you know kind of speaks to some of the drivers, some of the regulations. Are there you know are there other incentives out there uh, aside from you know being a, a good steward and wanting to protect your asset? I think that's kind of what this comes down to. But um, either of you want to take that one? Yeah, I've definitely seen clients ask for the a, a climate check type report to be included or appended to the ESA um, as part of their standard due diligence process. And that's because within their teams and their, due, their acquisitions or risk management teams, they want all that information to flow together along with any other ESG reporting they might have. As far as requirements or protections, um, I think it's more about pending or potential requirements that people are looking for on the regulatory side. But if they are trying to access um, international capital sources, like we have some clients that they go out to global investors and those global investors are holding them accountable and asking for them to explain how are they considering physical climate risk in their due diligence process. So, for them to be able to say we include it with our other due diligence reports is really helpful. They often will also have some sort of a back end um, platform where they can view all of the risks in their portfolio at once. And that reporting also flows up to their investors. And as, in terms of incentives, I would say currently the biggest incentive is access to that international capital, like I was talking about. But there are other things to be aware of. Um, there's C pace lending, commercial pace lending, which people usually associate with energy efficiency upgrades, but often C pace is available for resilience upgrades as well. And then lastly, I would just mention there's one insurance company, FM Global, that is currently offering property. Uh, insurance pricing reductions for properties that implement resilience measures. So it can actually turn into dollars. I think with some of the recent federal funding programs that have been launched over the last few years, there will be even more resilience-related funding coming through communities soon. Yeah, I'd say like uh, it is a, all great answers. And, uh, and just to build upon the kind of equity piece, uh, we see a lot of uh, investors, owners that take LP limited partner money and they're required to look at physical climate risk, even outside of kind of European money, uh, pension funds, insurance companies. Uh, so a lot of these new funds are required under the new fund structures to look at climate risk. So we, we get a lot of calls like, hey, now we need to start looking at this. Um, yeah, so I think that's a big incentive. And then it just comes back to kind of best practices, you know, maybe uh, the ESA world, uh, when the first ASTM standard was being created, you don't want to be the last owner with a bunch of underground storage tanks on your property. And so I think we're kind of seeing that within the industry It's just best practices. Great. Um, a couple data related questions here, Cal. Uh, first, will the Canadian version have the same hazards as the US version? Uh, yes. Yeah. The, the input data, again, we're completely transparent about what models we're putting in, uh, how we're synthesizing the data. And so it's all very clear. And so we have methodologies available for anyone that's interested, but the core hazards are all the same that we look at uh, in Canada. Some of the inputs are different because of different government data sets uh, and some of the granularities are different, but uh, uh, by and large, it's it's uh, it's the same. Flooding, fire, drought, precipitation, wind, uh, et cetera. Great, thanks. And um, one other question here, which climate models are used to provide the future risk scores? Yeah, right now we're using CMIP 5, uh, it's downscaled, uh, and we're looking at RCP 4.5 and 8.5. So that's that's really high level, but yeah, we're happy to share kind of methodologies and and uh, some of that gets above my pay grade pretty quickly. We've got some smart data scientists that come up. All right. Um, here's, here's one more. What is the average size and frequency of a climate check report for a lender of one asset? Um, did they receive all the background models and details? Uh, same questions on the upcoming ASTM PRA. 
I don't think I fully understand the question, but I think we're all seeing transactions are down, uh, but I think a kind of a transactional due diligence tool. And then as far as kind of portfolio analysis, a lot of the frequency we see is yearly. So looking, kind of screening the portfolio yearly, understanding the best science, what new assets were brought in and kind of what what is the distribution of risk across the portfolio? That usually happens on an annual basis. I, does that answer the question? I fully yeah, I, I think the average size question may be um, just at asset size, or is it? Or we can even break it into property type. I mean, are we looking at most? Is it is it mostly industrial properties? Is it, is it you know are, are people using this on small you know small retail owner occupied type stuff, or is it you know is it more larger type you know? type deals that would usually require a phase one? Yeah, within kind of our kind of commercial uh, line, it's uh, asset class agnostic. I, I'm, we see every kind of asset class come through. Um, and then size, generally more institutional, right? Like it's not gonna, we don't, no one's calling us for a fourplex, uh, but you know, <laughs> institutional size multifamily uh, or, or any asset class, yeah. Okay, and how about you, Holly? Um, yeah, we see it for everything. We don't do residential level, but I, I do want to point out that that some of this information is available to private individuals freely online. So, um, you know, another kind of driver in this space is that anyone purchasing a home or commercial property has access to this type of information now um, through lots of different sources. And I believe, Cal, you're platform allows for a free query at some point, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's a big part of kind of our mission as a company is, look, the consumer, the homeowner is not, they're, they're not going to pay for this. It's not how we monetize our business, but it's part of our mission is to provide that free to consumers. Uh, when you're looking at a home um, and we're on a lot of listing portals, Redfin, when you're searching for a home, um, and so we try to give a high level of this information to everyone to kind of, you know, bridge that asymmetry of data. And I think it's kind of that, that previous equity conversation. Yeah. So I, as I read Carol's question, I think it's, um, you know, the, the climate check report as an add on to an ESA, it was it 18 pages. You said, Cal, it's a PDF. It's less than 20 pages. It gets, you know, summarized in the ESA and then appended to the report, similar to a regular ARIS report. So from that standpoint, it, it's um, pretty something we're familiar with. In terms of the property resilience assessment reports, those really vary widely depending on which hazard are we looking at um, and how much, what methodologies exist to determine damage, downtime, community resilience considerations and safety concerns. So for instance, a, a PRA focused on seismic will have a lot of back end work similar with flood because there are existing methodologies for assessing how severe flood will impact property. But for some other hazards like drought, it might be a shorter report. So the we're in very early days in terms of these property resilience assessments, and I think things will evolve over time. But for now, the PRA reports are similar to what you would expect from a phase one or a PCA, but they can very become very in-depth and, and lengthy depending on what hazard you're looking at and how many buildings. I think we have time for for a couple more, and, and I do like this one, Holly. It's it's back to you. Um, what mitigation uh, mitigation strategies are you seeing successfully implemented uh, once users have a climate, you know, have the have the results back? And I, I think that's you know at the heart of it. That's you know that, that's really what you know what folks want want to find out. Okay, we have it. We've identified it. Now, what do we do? Yeah. Well, there's some recent research. I think I just shared on LinkedIn yesterday. Uh, that I just saw a, a friend, Nancy, um, at Milliken, which is an um, actuarial company, just published some research that shows homes that have done wildfire resilience measures um, have a huge impact on, um, actually, the home performs better, but so does the community because that home is more robust. So yeah. wildfire mitigation measures really do work. Flood mitigation measures also are very effective wind as well. There are, there, this is not uh, a mystery that these things have been worked on over the decades, right? The, the climate change piece of it and what will change going forward 
is somewhat new, but how to mitigate for these hazards is really not that new. And we have lots of great best practices. So an example would be um, a medical facility in Houston, subject to flood risk, implemented flood measures, both permanent and temporary, next event happened and the uh, facility was not affected. You know, it preserves the value, continues the business operation and the expense is well worth it. That being said, there are also a number of temporary flood measures in place in New York prior to Sandy, and most of them did not work because no one at the building knew how to utilize them and they hadn't been practicing with them. So many of you in the due diligence community are familiar with an operations and maintenance plan. That's also a really important component of many of these resilience measures. It's not just one and done, set it and forget it. You have to actually incorporate this into the operation of the building. Great, Cal, anything to add on that? No, I think it's really kind of owner specific, asset specific, understanding what you know, the client's looking for uh, in, 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 as long as ha as far as hazards and then kind of, you know, I, we'll, we'll see a lot of folks come in there, had some serious losses from a recent hurricane and they're particularly concerned with high wind. Um, and so I think you'll you'll find that, you know, different user end users are concerned with different things. But yeah, the body of work for how to protect these buildings, I mean, it's inherently built into the infrastructure, our building infrastructure in each region that experiences these hazards. So yeah, the, the none of it is really new, but it's really understanding kind of what's that property's vulnerability and, and what what measures are that we can put in place are missing and what can we recommend? That's, that's great. And there's another question here and I'll, I'll kind of paraphrase it a little bit, but have either of you, seen any deals halted or, or stopped or, or not go through as a result of, uh, you know, either reports delivered or, or reports that you guys have reviewed, Holly? Most of the folks we're working with have said that this isn't the thing that's making them make a decision one way or another, but it's a piece of information. And, and this is, again, why I'm so passionate about the due diligence community having a big role here. We've always been helping people understand the risks so they can make informed decisions. And this is just expanding that lens of what's important so they can make good decisions. I think if um, other aspects of the deal were not as attractive and you had another and a climate risk was laid upon that, you might make a different decision. But I haven't heard of anyone specifically walking from a deal due to climate risk consideration. Another example of a client is a hospitality client that has a big resort um, in the coast, Florida Keys, right? So they might, they already own, maybe they're not going to, um, you know, they're not walking from the property at this point, but it might go into how much more do we invest in this property? What do we think the lifespan will be? And it's just more strategic thinking information. Yeah, I think I, I, we've seen very similar stuff. Uh, folks aren't backing out of deals. Uh, you know, the, the, there's still folks in the fundamental metrics, right? IRR, what's the NOI of the building? How does it fit within their fund structure? Uh, but it is a key piece of risk information that they can help could reduce those risks with easy measures. Uh, so we're not seeing folks back away from deals. But I get, to Holly's point, really interesting. Like we're starting, even recently in the last few months, we're starting to see a lot of people doing due diligence on these assets, bringing them to the portfolio, monitoring the portfolio. Because the next step really is informing your investment thesis. Okay, we have this distribution of risk uh, across the portfolio here. Like, let's think about how uh, we can adjust that moving forward with new assets we're bringing in or new loans we're bringing in. And so I think that's kind of the, uh, I don't want to get too far ahead from the base due diligence, but that's kind of what we're starting to see is like, where do we go next? Okay, great. Uh, yeah, a couple more that they keep, they keep flowing in here. So do insurance companies have approved lists of flood response measures and equipment? And is that public information? Um, the one that I mentioned, FM Global, that gives preferred pricing if you implement resilience measures, FM Global does have specific resilience measures that they would like to see implemented to access those discounts, and they are public information on the FM Global site. I'm not aware of any others. All right, um, Cal, a, a couple quick ones here for you. Um, the turnaround time of a climate check report. 
Yeah, I mean, it's all a data product. It's it's uh, relatively instantaneous uh, within a few minutes. Okay. And how about that portfolio sample? I think that was 2,500 sites or so within that that sample that you showed earlier, something like that. How how long would that take to run? I think on any portfolio like that, you, you all know how messy addresses are in API. Yeah. So uh, it's a it's a bit of work for Eris, but I, I, I can't... It, It'll turn around pretty quickly. Sometimes we spend a few days on it. Um, yep. Make sure we have the portfolio correct. Make sure we're matching everything correct. We're looking at the right assets. Um, but yeah, in the end, it's a, a data product. Okay. Um, let's see here. How does one go about ordering a climate check report to be used as an ESA addendum? Uh, the reports can be ordered directly to our website at, at this point. So uh, as far as incorporating it uh, within ESA addendum, I think that's that really falls to the to the consultant. And Holly, you're seeing some of it alongside a, a PCA too, right? Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, I think um, the PCA, those companies that are attending that have the PCA side of your staff as well, I think this is really important. Um, you know, property condition assessments, I don't think it's required in the ASTM standard, but there is a section on natural hazards. And, I, you know, people have said, really, we need to start incorporating this information as a best practice. So one of our task group members has used this word climate informed due diligence or phrase climate informed due diligence. And I think all of us need to be prepared for the ways in which ESA and the PCA will change over time to incorporate this type of information going forward. All right, we have a, a couple minutes. Any closing thoughts, Holly, from you? Um, well, I think one of the things I would just recommend if anyone, it looks like there's a lot of interest in um, receiving this information and, and taking a look at it. One piece of advice is to begin with the end in mind and make sure you have a plan for what you're going to do with the information once you have it. And that's where the PRA may come into play if you're interested in learning more about it. But to just receive the hazard information and not know what you're going to do with all your high risk sites um, can I think kind of back a few people into a corner and then they're like, oh, I forgot to think about what I was going to do about this. So uh, that would be my advice is I think it's really important to take a step forward. This is coming to due diligence and we should be prepared. And I think it takes some time to work through what your processes will be, get your staff trained up and so on. So I think experimenting with the data is really important, but also kind of having a plan and knowing where you're going with it is important. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Cal? Yeah, I think that's great. I'll just piggyback on that. I mean, it's evolving quickly. I think a lot of folks would be surprised how many of their clients are actually looking at this in some form. And yeah, just get ahead of it. You know, I think as it's growing, uh, start understanding the data, start understanding what the client's needs are, how they're looking at it. And uh, yeah, I think this is a, a, an opportunity. And uh, I think, uh, and going back to the ASTM guidelines around this, I think that's uh, so important for kind of helping folks, give them a roadmap and a guide for how to do it. So uh, super grateful for Holly for leading that task group. Yeah, um, well, unfortunately that's, all the time we have for today an hour goes by pretty pretty quickly sometimes when it's a topic like this so uh, if anybody did want to read more uh, about climate risk assessments or commercial real estate or environmental property assessments uh, please visit the ARIS info hub there's plenty of information there as I mentioned earlier uh, this presentation will be available within the next couple of days too um, I would like to give a, a big thank you to Cal and and Holly you guys uh, shared your expertise. It was awesome. I, I couldn't have asked for more. So uh, thank you again from everyone here at Ares for joining us today. I thought it was 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 really great. Um, to users uh, and, and attending, thank you for your hour today. We certainly appreciate you guys joining and hopefully you guys were able to, um, you know, get a lot out of it. I, again, I, I think it was really a, a really well done webinar. So thank you for attending and stay tuned for, for more uh, ARIS webinars coming up. We have one coming up on the first Wednesday or on the first is on Wednesday, March 15th. It'll be a virtual demo of our report authoring platform, Scriba. Uh, there's a link in the chat and also on our, our webpage as well. And following that, 
in March, we've invited a panel to talk about a dry cleaning update, uh, regulations, remediation, and redevelopment. So stay tuned for that. Um, and with that, uh, again, I want to thank everybody for your time and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Great to be here. Thanks for being on. <laughs> thank you.